Chapter 18 of The Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 Peter Goes to Town. One day, if we saw a woman gowned as Mrs. Montgomery was gowned when she visited Riverbank, we would laugh her to ridicule. But the toys Peter Lane whittled that winter are still admired for their design and execution. There is a collection of them in the rooms of the Riverbank Historical Society. We laugh, too, when we see photographs of Main Street as it was when Peter came to town after his winter on Big Tree Lake, with the mud almost hub-deep. That was before the new banks were built or the brick paving laid, and Main Street was a ragged, ill-kept thoroughfare, with none of the city airs it has since donned. But as Peter stepped out of the First National Bank and stood for a minute on the steps in the warm spring sunshine, the street looked like an old friend, and this was the more odd because it had never looked like a friend before. Jim Van Dyne had just cashed the checks and money orders Peter had accumulated during the winter. They were for small amounts, a few dollars each, and not until the cashier had pushed the pile of crisp bills under the wicket, mentioning the amount, did happy-go-lucky Peter realize how much his winter earnings had amounted to. "'Quite a lot of money,' Jim had said. "'How would you like to open an account?' And Peter had opened his first bank account. The warm, leather-bound bank book now reposed in his pocket. Peter could feel it pressing against him and he could feel the extra bulge the checkbook made in his hip pocket. He felt like a serf raised to knighthood, with armor protecting him against harm. As he stood there, Mr. Howard, the bank's president, came briskly down the street. He was a short, chubby man, and he had always nodded cheerfully to Peter. But now he stopped and extended his hand. "'How do you do?' he said cheerfully. Jim Van Dyne has been telling me what you have been doing this winter. Glad to know you are making a go of it. It was not much. The bank president was not a great bank president, and the bank was not much of a bank, as great banks go. And he had not, after all, said much. But it made Peter's brown cheeks glow. Bank presidents do not often stop to shake hands with shanty boatmen, nor do they pause to congratulate them, although the bank president may be an infernal rascal and the shanty boatman a moral king. But Peter did not philosophize. He knew that if enough bank presidents shake the hand of an ex shanty boatman, the world will consider the shanty boatman respectable enough to raise one freckle faced, kinky headed little waif of a boy. Peter raised his head higher than ever, and he had always held it high. He was a man, like other men, now. He could, if he wished, build another shanty boat. He could hire it built. He could rent a house and put a carpet on the parlor floor. He could say he was going to Florida, and people would believe him. He could buy a suit of clothes a whole complete entire suit vest and all it had been years and years since he could do that and when he had been able to do it he had always spent the money otherwise now he crossed the street and entered the riverbank clothing emporium it gave him a warming feeling of respectability to be buying clothes but he did not plunge recklessly he bought everything he needed from socks and shoes to tie and hat, but the shoes were stout and cheap, and the shirt a woolen one, and the hat a soft felt that would stand wind and weather. Mr. Rosenheim himself came and stood by Peter when he was trying on the shoes. "'My wife was showing me the piece about you in the magazine,' he said. "'I guess you are the first man in Riverbank to get into magazines. We should be proud of you, Lane.' "'Who, me in a magazine? I guess not.' "'Oh, sure. I read some of it. 
some such art and crafts magazine with photo cuts from them toys you make ain't you seen it nope let me try on a seven and a half b he said calmly but his pulse quickened well i suppose you are used to being puffed up already said mr rosenheim i wish i could get such free advertising when peter looked at himself in the store mirror he was well satisfied mr rosenheim nodded his approval that suit looks like it was made for you mr lane he said and he did not know what a great truth he was uttering for peter so long in rags and the simple quiet suit seemed well fitted for each other's company peter went out upon the street and at the first corner he met bouge he was the same old frowsy hairy bouge and he greeted peter in the same deep bass did you get the papers to rescue the child he asked melodramatically i hid them under the stone at the corner of the lane meet me at midnight hush a stranger approaches there were several strangers approaching for they were standing on the corner of the two principal streets peter grinned george rapp brought it down to me he said i thought you were in for six months sheriff discharged me said bouge i ate too much he couldn't figure a profit so he kicked me out you don't mean it no teacher excused me at noon so i could go to dancing class said bouge how did you get out peter insisted there wasn't room for me and briggles in the same jail said bouge we was always singing out of harmony was briggles in jail they caught the old kazoozer 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 they caught the old kazoozer and took him to the jail hummed bouge and i got excused so i could go and hunt up susie i was her responsible guardian ain't that a joke what are you going to do now asked peter i don't know said bouge thoughtfully i ain't made up my mind whether to run for mayor or buy the opera house but if anybody was to give me a nickel i'd give up whiskey and buy beer if not i'll stand around here till i do get arrested the town cop has promised and promised to do it but he ain't reliable i've got so i don't depend on his word no more peter took a silver dollar from his pocket and handed it to the tramp and bouge started across the street to the nearest saloon without farewell peter took a step after him and then turned back i guess it's what he likes he said and i couldn't stop him if i wanted to peter turned into the star restaurant and took a seat at one of the red covered tables bob he said can you get me up one of them oyster stews of yours one of them milk stews with plenty of oysters and a hunk of butter thawing out on top fix me one and then i want a chicken a nice fresh young chicken killed about day before yesterday split open and broiled right on top of the coals so the burned smell will come sifting in before the chicken is ready and i want it on a hot plate a plate so hot i'll holler when i grab it and i want some of your fried potatoes in a side dish hash browned potatoes browned almost crisp in the dish with bacon chopped up in them and i want a big cup of coffee with real cream even if you have to send out for it and then bob i want a whole lemon meringue pie a whole one three inches thick and fourteen inches across i've been wanting to eat a whole lemon meringue pie ever since i was fourteen years old and now i'm going to i'm going to have one full fine first-class meal and then then what asked bob then i'm going to go and get an alarm clock that belongs to me end of chapter eighteen
Chapter 19 of The Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Peter Gets His Clock. For a man who means to walk it, considering the usual state of the river road in spring, the railway is the best path between Riverbank and Widow Potter's farm, and Peter, leaving the town, took to the railway track. He had, he assured himself, a definite purpose in visiting Mrs. Potter. She had expressed her views of a man who fell so low as to pawn his goods and chattels, and the wound still rankled, and Peter meant to have back his alarm clock. That, he repeated to himself, was why he was going to Mrs. Potter's, but in his heart he knew this was not so. He wanted to see Buddy. He wanted, before the boy forgot him, to re-establish for a moment the old ties. In short, he was jealous of Mrs. Potter. As he walked up the track, he planned the interview in advance. "'Mrs. Potter,' he would say, "'I have come to get my clock. Here is the money, and I'm sorry I had to trouble you to keep it so long.' Then he would lay the money on the kitchen table, and Mrs. Potter, slightly awed by his new clothes, would hand him the clock. "'And if possible,' he would say then, "'I'd like to speak with Buddy a few minutes.' Mrs. Potter would then call Buddy. That was as he planned it, but the nearer he approached Mrs. Potter's cove, the less likely it seemed to Peter that Mrs. Potter would be much awed by the clothes. By the time he was within half a mile of the cove, he was not only sure that Mrs. Potter was not the woman to be awed by anything, but he began to wish he had not bought the clothes. He could imagine her tone as she put her hands on her hips and looked him over and said, "'Well, of all the shiftlessness I ever heard tell of, going and dressing yourself up like a dude, and you not a roof in the world to hide your head under.' He wished he could see himself just once more in a large mirror, so that he might renew the feeling of confidence he had felt at Rosenheim's. Instead, he felt much as a young fellow feels when he dons his first dress suit and steps upon the dancing floor. He felt stiff and awkward, and that every garment he wore was a showy misfit. He did not seem to be Peter Lane at all, but some flashy, overdressed, uncomfortable stranger. He suddenly realized that he had his hands and feet, and that the new hat was stiff and uncomfortable, and that the tie, so placidly blue in the dusk of the clothing store, was rampantly and screamingly blue in the full light of day. He felt that he had done an inexcusable and reckless thing in buying the new clothes, and he knew Mrs. Potter would tell him so. Peter decided that, since he was sure to be in for a horrible half-hour, he would assert his manhood. If Mrs. Potter scolded, he would sass back. He had money in the bank, hadn't he? He had heard enough of her hard words, hadn't he? All right. The minute she said shiftless, he would speak right up. He would look her firmly in the eye and say something like, now stop you've talked to me that way before mrs potter when i was a poor shanty boatman but i've had just about enough of it i'm tired of that he would hide the misery of his clothes in a flood of high words that is to say if mrs potter gave him a chance for as peter turned from the track to the road and neared the gate he saw it all depended on mrs potter if she did not wish him to talk, that would end it, and it was a meek, uneasy, uncomfortable, undecided, miserable Peter that turned in at the gate. And then, before he could tuck the sleeves of his flannel shirt, which seemed to have grown until they were ridiculously long, into his coat cuffs, which seemed to have become ridiculously short, a young girl jumped from behind one of the old apple trees and stood staring at him. Peter took off his hat as if she had been a princess. 
He was in the state of mind when he would have taken off his hat to a wax figure. But the girl stood but for a moment. Then she ran toward him. "'I know who you are,' she cried. "'You're Uncle Peter, ain't you? I'm Susie.' "'Susie?' said Peter. "'Are you Susie?' He tried to greet her as a man should greet a strange child, but she would have none of it. She threw her arm around his right arm and hugged it, jumping up and down. "'Oh, Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter!' she cried joyously, and turning, she screamed at the top of her voice, "'Buddy! Buddy! Buddy! Here's Uncle Peter!' Around the corner of the house popped a hatless, kinky head. "'Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter!' screamed Buddy, running with a strange little hippity-hop. "'Oh, Uncle Peter! My Uncle Peter! My Uncle Peter!' And he threw himself into Peter's arms, laughing and crying and trembling with joy, repeating over and over, through the laughter and the tears, "'My Uncle Peter!' my uncle peter my buddy my old buddy boy peter murmured hugging him close my old buddy boy so it happened that he was not thinking of his new clothes when mrs potter came to the kitchen door well for the land's sake peter lane she cried while buddy clung to his neck and susie clung around one leg it's about time. I thought you never was coming. I've been waiting here for you with these two fatherless children. From the kitchen came the rackety banging of the alarm clock, proving that, as the clock was set to ring at six, Peter had found a mother for the fatherless children at just seventeen minutes past three. If it wouldn't annoy you too much to get married, Mrs. Potter, said Peter, gasping at his own temerity, and wiping his forehead on the sleeve of his new coat. "'I can... I could... We'd have quite a nice little family to start off with right away.' "'Annoy me? Is that what you call a proposal to marry me, Peter Lane?' asked Mrs. Potter scornfully. "'Ain't you ever going to be able to talk up like a man?' "'Yes, I am.' snapped peter will you marry me yes i will snapped the widow potter the end end of chapter 19 end of the jackknife man by ellis parker butler recording by roger moline